Yo, what's up? Welcome to Kind of Funny Games Daily for Monday, November 29th, 2021. I'm one of your host, Blessing, Adioye Jr. Joining me is the LaCroix Poppy himself, Tim Ma fucking Gettys. We're back, baby, and it feels good. The intro did that thing that it does every once in a while where it lasts oh, yeah. just a little longer than normal, and it's like it throws oh, yeah. you off. It, it, that one second of silence feels like an eternity. <laughs> I don't understand how it ever changes. It's all It's the same button. There is no other button. I press the same button every day, and sometimes, sometimes, for an unknown reason, it just goes a little it's longer. Positive. I, I like it because toes. Yeah, that's that's why I like it. It keeps me on my toes. I've, I've had it happen so much. It's destroying me emotionally. I've had it happen so much. Now, like I'm like, don't let it phase you. Don't let it phase you. Don't change the facial expression. Just keep eye contact and just keep that smile until until Hell your, yeah. your face is revealed. I love it it's so pearly much. Pearly whites, Jim. baby. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, man. I'm happy to be here with you oh, yeah. today. We have a lot of fun content. We're back. Kind of funny content is back. We've been gone the last back. couple of days. We just reviewed Hawkeye episodes one and two. Those will be going up on YouTube.com slash kind of funny soon. We got Matrix in review starting later today. Oh, what a oh, time man. to be alive. How excited are you for, for Matrix? I'm very, very excited. Very. Okay. Excited. Are you a Matrix fan? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say okay. I'm like a super fan, but yeah, definitely a fan. Gotcha, gotcha. I might, I might make this my opportunity to re- rewatch Matrix because, like, that's one of those movies that I haven't seen since like HBO the early two thousands. Since I was a kid, it's on HBO Max. Yeah, all of them are. The new one even is going to be on HBO Max when is it comes Animatrix out. Is Animatrix on oh, there? Oh man, I don't know, dude. Animatrix is my shit. I've never. I seen was it. all in on I've Animatrix. I've always wanted to see it. I was promised that we were going to make that part of the review, but I guess it's not. That, that was fun because that was that was one of the ones where. That. That was during, I believe that was like WB Kids, and that was during the Saturday morning cartoons block of no, like. No, I think you're thinking something else. The am I thinking of something else? Was, no, was, you're right. I'm thinking of the Men in Black cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> That's very different. I don't know why. I don't know why the Men in Black cartoon is. I don't know why I got those things confused. I have no idea why. The Men in Black cartoon was on the WB Kids on Saturday morning, and that was my shit. But you never okay. knew what to expect. But. Plus. Two things. First off, I just threw my headphones down way too hard. Yeah, you yeah, be Second off, break. second off. <laughs> okay, I hate on. you. I hate you so I, much. But I'm gonna Google but, Animatrix real quick. The Men in Black animated show was fucking awesome. It was great, wasn't it? It was oh, really second, good. It was really second good. only to Godzilla the animated series. That was awesome. the Animatrix oh. the shit. It, the animatrix, animatrix wasn't a series. It, I mean, it was like a it was like an anthology a film. Oh yeah. shit. It was four, wow. or maybe five, nine, fifteen minute. Not, no way, nine. I think so. No, that sounds wrong. That's but wild. it was it was like uh, just anime stories from the Matrix world that fill in things between one and two. That's and crazy. Was, All this this whole time, I thought I'd watch Animatrix. But it was Men in Black, the cartoon. But, like, the point I was oh, making, though, right. and I'm, I'm just going to shift it to Men in Black, the cartoon, real quick. I forget what it was called. Was it Men in Black, the animated series? I digress. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I think so. That was one of the ones where I would show up to WB Kids to watch Jackie Chan Adventures, specifically, and, like, Static Shock. And mm-hmm. then everything else was like, okay, we'll see if, if this stuff slaps or not. Men in Black, the animated series, was one that caught me off guard, where I was like, oh, there's no way this can be. Even as a kid, I was like, there's no way this can be good. And I watched it, and I was like, this is incredible. This is incredible. fantastic. So good. Fantastic content. But, Tim, we got a whole bunch of fantastic content to get into. So let's talk about today's stories, which include a new Marvel MMO incoming, a Game Awards reveal that's been 2.5 years in the making, and more, because this is Kind of Funny Games Daily. Each and every weekday at 10 a.m. live, right here on twitch.tv slash kindoffunnygames, we run you through the nerdy news you need to know about. If you're watching live, you can correct us when we get stuff wrong by going to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. If you don't want to watch live, you can watch later on youtube.com slash kindoffunnygames, roosteeth.com, or you can listen later on podcast services around the globe by searching for Kind of Funny Games Daily. Remember, you can use Epic Creator Code Kind of Funny on all Epic Store and Epic in-game purchases like Rocket League and Fortnite to help support the channel. To be a part of the show, to patreon.com slash kindoffunnygames or bronze members or above get to write in and silver members or above get the show ad-free with the exclusive daily post show. 
Housekeeping for you, about an hour after this KFGD ends, we're recording PS I Love You XOXO live on Patreon. That is going to be our PlayStation Now 2021 review. Uh, you can write in with your questions and thoughts about PlayStation Now uh, over on patreon.com slash games for Janet and me to talk about on the show. And then our Hawkeye episodes one and two reviews up on YouTube featuring Tim, Nick, and Kevin breaking down all their thoughts and feelings on the new Marvel show. That is up on youtube.com slash funny. And then tomorrow is Giving Tuesday, and we're raising money for Project Hope. Uh, what are we streaming? Well, Greg Miller is making a comeback to stream some Marvel's Avengers with Snowbike Mike and see how Spider-Man plays on opening day. If you want to check that out, you can tune in tomorrow after Kind of Funny Games Daily on twitch.tv slash Kind of Funny Games. Thank, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you to our Patreon producers, Prank C and Black. I almost like just choked uh, just then. <laughs> Today brought to you by Purple Mattress, DraftKings, and Liquid IV, but... We'll tell you about that later. For now, let's begin with what is and forever will be the Roper Report. It's time for some news. We have six stories today. A baker's dozen. Starting with our number one, a new Marvel MMO is incoming. This is from Wesley Yinpool at Eurogamer. The developer of DC Universe Online is making a Marvel MMO. <laughs> Yeah. Dimensional Inc. Studios, the latest name for the Austin, Texas branch of Daybreak Game Company, is working on a Marvel IP-based ma based massively multiplayer online game, according to an investor presentation. This investor presentation was published online by parent company EG7 and spotted by Twitter user and Twitch streamer Miller, not to be confused with Greg Miller. Mm -hmm. Development of the so far unannounced MMO is led by Jack Emmert, who co-founded Cryptic Studios, designed and helmed City of Heroes, and currently leads the 10-year-old DC Universe online. That's all we know for now, but it's worth noting Daybreak Game Company has reportedly worked on a Marvel MMO a few years ago, but it was apparently canceled, sparking a round of layoffs late 2018. It's also worth noting that Cryptic Studios worked on a Marvel Universe on Marvel Universe Online in 2006 before Microsoft canceled it in 20, in 2008. Marvel Universe Online was later reborn as Cryptic's Champions Online. Gazillion Entertainment's Marvel Heroes launched in 2013 but shut down in late 2017. Don't hold your breath for this new Marvel MMO though. Uh, the investor presentation lists this under the longer term projects. This could be a this could be a 2023 game at the earliest. Tim, what does it do for you? I, this is pretty cool, you know, especially for people like Greg Miller that were like the number one fan of DC Universe Online and for them to have found the success they did with that game over time. You know, it never yeah. really became like the biggest breakout hit, but like I think they really kind of found their footing uh, and to now take that expertise and partner it with uh license as big as marvel at this point in time i think could be really cool and really uh like good and vibrant for the community that is going to be interested in this i don't like these type of games so i don't really think this speaks to me that much but um i think that this is inevitable in in some way i remember they announced marvel heroes back in the day um that was semi like this um i think mm -hmm. that one was a little bit a different type of genre a little bit but um this this makes sense I, i'm not too surprised by it and i'm definitely not surprised that it's a longer term project that we're not getting anytime soon yeah i like that we're hearing about it this early like it makes me curious on on what this is actually going to end up being and what and i guess what the reception is going to be of it because i think dc universe online is one that i've heard a lot about but that's mo that's that's mainly from greg miller <laughs> yeah. right like i've not heard like the wide gaming universe talk about dc universe online in like an ongoing way right i think there was that spark uh toward the launch of it and like you had a community you had people that were going crazy for it but I look at something like an art, a Marvel MMO made by the same folks a decade later, and I go, oh, shit, that has a lot of potential to blow up because now you're taking the learnings of DC Universe Online, you're taking the trust that they've had after working on that for so long, and you're applying it to the power of Marvel games recently, which, you know, has been putting out hit after hit and, like, some misses. And Avengers. But, yeah. yeah, and Avengers. But, like, I think there's there's enough there in terms of things that they've been getting right, and there's enough, there's a good enough vision there at Marvel Games in terms of partnering the right IPs with the right studios that this doesn't seem like a thing that happens by accident or by coincidence or by happenstance, right? This seems like a thing that is, hey, we identify you. We know what we want in a Marvel MMO, and you guys seem to be the guys that can, br that can bring this to fruition. And so for that, I'm excited about it. And I'm with you that it's not necessarily my type of game. A Marvel MMO is probably the, th the MMO that would get me into playing that type of game. And so I'm all about this. This sounds super exciting to me. 
what, what's really cool about it too is just kind of seeing how the industry has changed since DC Universe Online first came out, where I think a lot of the the more recent success, and again, it's all relative, but the recent success of DC Universe Online, a game that is 12 years old at this point, right? Like it is kind of the fact that it's still around in any uh, extent is very mm-hmm. impressive and i think that it's because we've seen things like it being free on playstation plus and it kind of like having these like new ways to get into people's hands and now that there's this kind of like understanding of free-to-play games and different types of uh, ways to to monetize these ongoing live games i think that there's a lot of potential for them to have combined their expertise with the design of the game that they've already made with dc universe online modernize it a bit but then also have a better chance of actual success both with interest from um gamers where i think there are more gamers out there now that are willing to give mmos a shot um it's not just a pc thing it is now translated to consoles as well but like easily um which i think wasn't always the the case back in the day for for this type of uh genre so i, I think that this is the highest chance of success a uh, superhero mmo could ever have <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, and, I mean, when you look at the lineage, right? These are the right folks to do it because they're talking, they're talking about like, you know, the studio that started off with City of Heroes, which was a huge superhero MMO, right? Went on to do DC Universe Online, and when you're talking about superhero MMOs, that right there is, I think that that right there, I think speaks to legacy and speaks to, hey, we are the guys that have been doing this in the biggest way, and we are the guys that you want working on a Marvel MMO. My question for you, Tim, is. Do you think we're going to reach a point of oversaturation when it comes to Marvel games? Because when I look at a, when I look at a Marvel MMO, I think the thing that comes to mind immediately are the similar kinds of games that we've gotten in the space. And I know, like, it, technically these are very different things, but we have gotten things like Marvel's Ultimate Alliance, and we have gotten Marvel's Avengers, and we are getting Mid- Midnight Suns. And again, these are specific genres that speak to specific niches. But do you think we're going to hit a point where it's like, wow, we got a lot of Marvel? So I, I think that we've already hit the point that it's like, wow, we have a lot of Marvel. But I I think that to the point you just made, I don't think these games are being designed at all to be like, oh, you need to play all of them. You know, like mm. them, the fact that they don't all connect, there's not like a gaming universe that they're it's building It's not the MCU. Here. No, it's not the MCU. It is very much kind of like, hey, what genre do you like? Cool, let's get into it. Like, here's a, a opportunity. I do think that they are aware of it. And that's why I think they're bringing brands like Midnight Suns, right? Like that is not necessarily the most mainstream of comic properties but that's just where we're at as a mainstream audience where there is an understanding of so many levels of marvel events due to the movies and and um the not just the marvel studios movies but like at this point 20 years of history of the x-men movies the spider-man movies the daredevil movies the fantastic four movies like we kind of a lot of people out there get it, get these characters, get these stories. So doing something a little bit different, I think, is uh, a, a, an all-time high in terms of understandability for people. And just applying that to different genres and having different talented developers work on stuff like Insomniac working on these third-person action adventures while we have you know, the RTS being made by the XCOM guys. It's like that makes so much sense. And I, I don't think that that hits oversaturation because – these are, at the end of the day, these are just characters. And I think that a lot of people can look at it and see the Marvel logo and be like, oh, it's all the same. It's not. Like the uh, an Iron Man game and a Spider-Man game and a Wolverine game, those are all different things because those are different characters with different motivations, both personally and character-wise, but also from gameplay perspective, right? So mm-hmm. I, I don't think that we're in a worry for that. Look at Star Wars, right? Like there's been so many bad games, but there's been so many good games. And I don't think that an oversaturation of Star Wars games was the problem back in the PS2 era. That was just a thing that people loved. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, through through the amount of Star Wars games we got during that era, right? Like, there were the ones that didn't hit as well, but there were ones that really hit, and those ones that really hit are the ones that we remember we still talk about, right? Like, we still talk about those Battlefront games. We still talk about, like, the, I talk about Star Wars Racer for the N64, right, and how much I love that game. Um, but then there are plenty there are plenty of those ones that fell by the wayside and, like, games that came out. And, you know, there were a moment, I think of things like Star Wars Episode Three on the PS2 that I played at a friend's house, went... Uh, this game's whatever, and then like didn't think about it again. But that didn't take away from me playing things like Star Wars Racer and other Star Wars games that I ended up loving. You know, I think a lot of this is kind of throwing things at throwing things at a wall and seeing what sticks. And you know, if something like Marvel's Avengers doesn't stick, that doesn't mean a Marvel MMO isn't going to stick. And that doesn't mean that they also get in the way of each other because they're very different things. Now, on the same topic, of course, 
Greg Miller is the biggest fan, I, I know at least, of DC Universe Online, and also a huge fan of Marvel's Avengers. And when we posted this news in the Slack, he replied saying, I better get a call <laughs> about this on KHD. So I'm going to go ahead and ring his phone. Whether or not he answers, we'll see. But just so we, just so we can say that we did, I'm going to ring him. The anticipation's killing me. Yeah, no. I'm what the hell could he shot. possibly be doing right now? Jesus. Hey, he's busy. He's busy. God, the Who knows? You should, re- you should respond to that Slack and be like, not like you answer. I'm going to do you it. I mean, yeah. I'm going to do it. Do I it, like bless. Dope. Dope. Because I was very excited about this call. I really want to know what Greg Miller had to say about Marvel. We'll never know. We'll never know. We'll never know. Never I guess know. you'll have to ask him tomorrow. God, on I the love Twitch the idea stream. that he's going to come on some random show and be like, this is what I feel about the thing. <laughs> God. God. <laughs> we'll have to wait and see. For now, let's talk about story number two. One Game Awards reveal has been 2.5 years in the making. I'm pulling from Jordan Midler at Video 2. Games 5. Chronicle. Two and a half years. Uh, host and creator of the Game Awards, Jeff Keighley, has claimed that the December 9th show will feature a world premiere that he has been, quote, working on with a developer for two and a half years, end quote. In a tweet published on Sunday, Keighley said that he visited the developer in the summer of 2019. Quote, just saw the final cut of a hashtag the Game Awards world premiere we have been working on with a developer for 2.5 years. Truly honored we are entrusted to share the, share this work with the world. 2.5 years sounds like a long time, but summer of 2019 was actually my last global tour to visit developers. I always have so much fun visiting studios and hearing about their projects. Hope to do it again in 2022, Jeff Keighley tweeted. 2020 show saw reveals of a reboot of Perfect Dark and an untitled Mass Effect game from Bioware. Tim, what do you think this two and a half year reveal could be? I, I mean, I think this is a, a perfect example of why I love doing kind of funny games daily because we <laughs> talk about video game news every day and we find these things that turn into headlines and find uh, discussion topics about it. It's hilarious that this is the headline because I feel like that implies something that isn't what Jeff Keighley's saying. Like, it's not like, oh, there's something that's been two and a half years in the making. It's like, yeah, okay, the last two and a half years have been a fucking pandemic. So the yeah. last time that he went out to see the devs was two and a half years ago. So I imagine there's been a lot of reveals that are two and a half years in the making. So I don't think that uh, that alone Alone makes this like some golden goose i don't think this is half-life 3 i don't think that this is like some holy crap a remake of you know some place beloved playstation game like a metal gear solid or something like that um i do think this is going to be cool like the last couple of years of game awards there's always been at least one holy shit announcement if not multiple i mean remember this xbox series x was revealed at the game awards like that is a big deal you know what i mean um so what they're gonna bring this year i don't know but i'm excited i I think that jeff's confident in this show um what this game particularly is i i don't know i have a couple Mm -hmm. ideas but i'm not i don't want to put them out into the world you don't want to put them out there i was ready for you to put them out there because i have a couple ideas too because i i look at this and here's my thing it's jeff keely jeff keely is very he's very online he reads the replies and i feel like not that he's careful with what he tweets but i think he's thoughtful i think Mm -hmm. when he says something like oh, we have a reveal that's been 2.5 years in the making. I think he says that knowing the level of expectation people are going to attach to that. But, but he also, he explains it in his tweet that like two and a half years sounds like a long time, but summer 2019 was actually my last global trip. So like, even he it, kind it, of he like- makes, He makes it make sense, but also like he still said it, which makes me think that like, oh shit, this might be some like some some cool thing. Not necessarily, I don't think it's the things that you also said it's not going to be, right? Yeah. I don't think it's going to be like some- unannounced like half-life 3 that is here or like metal gear solid or, or something crazy like that what i do think it could be is something that is that we know exists right but we haven't seen much of yet or still has info to come out when i think of two and a half years tim you know was announced two and a half years ago the legend, <gasps> the of, legend zelda, of zelda breath, breath of the, the wild, wild untitled yeah. sequel exactly could we get a title and a release date for breath of the wild 2 we could. I don't think that that's likely, but we could. The thing is, Nintendo always used to have one big announcement at the Game Awards. That big announcement could have been Funky Kong is coming to Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze, or it could be Jokers in Smash Brothers, right? Like, there was, mm-hmm. there was like, a lot of, of levels to this shit, uh, but they haven't necessarily always done that. I don't think that Nintendo's had a big announcement there at the last two years i want to say um so i wouldn't be surprised either way breath of the wild is that big kind of question mark where uh we could hear about it and it's coming out in march or it's not coming out uh until the end of next year or even the following year so it's like until we're a little closer 
I don't know, but I don't think he's talking about Zelda uh, with this this quote in particular. Now, Tim, you know, you know what else we got? A quote unquote announcement, but not ne- necessarily like a reveal of two years ago was Bioshock. Uh, uh, 2K came out and they were like, we are working on, on Bioshock. Cloud Chamber is developing it. And like, we've not seen anything of that game. I feel like that would fit well in a world premiere. And I could see that being at something like the Game Awards. I feel like the Game Awards is like the right venue to show it. Do you think there's anything there? Um, I don't. I agree with you that a Bioshock announcement at the Game Awards feels right. Like that does yeah. feel like the the type of audience that Jeff's trying to to go after. Um, because it is that that blend of mainstream and hardcore, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's always interesting because so many of these these announcements, like we're gonna get a bunch of world premieres. A lot of them are gonna be marketing things, like just advertisements, and some of them are gonna be uh games that we we know about, and then there's gonna be some banger ass announcements. Like that's just how this shit goes. Um, I kind of expect this to the, the, whatever they're teasing here, I I think that it might be on that level of a a perfect dark, right? Like we, we got the reveal at the game awards a couple years ago for that. And I think that I expect that at the game awards, whether or not this reveal is it, I do think we're going to get at least a game announcement that we have not heard about or that's not a, we've heard about but it's not officially announced i think a new game will be officially announced that's going to make us go like oh shit yeah yeah and that's why that's why bioshock is kind of the reach for me and kind of the top the top that i'll reach for in terms of what this thing could be it could be anywhere it could be anywhere in terms of like hype below that right it could be the chrono cross remake it could be plenty of things but when jeff talks about having visited stu- uh, the, the studio in 2019 it makes me think that it's something that either is publicly known or just known to be in development. Like what studio would Jeff be, Jeff visit and be at? I find that hard to think that it, it, that would be Nintendo with Breath of the Wild 2. Maybe it is because Jeff has clout like that, but something like Cloud Chamber with Bioshock, I think makes sense because that is a thing that we know exists, right? Like what is something that we know exists and has existed for the last couple of years that is in development that would make sense that Jeff would go check out. Um, it might be in talks with, and so, We'll see about that one. I'm very hyped. I hope it's Bioshock or the yeah. Breath of the Wild 2 sequel. I, I mean, regardless, dude, we're a week away from the Game Awards, man. Like, that's that's oh, yeah. nuts. Like, we're about to get some some announcements, some, like, big heavy hidden stuff. Like, this this is the, like, first Game Awards that's not, like, in the thick of it with the pandemic stuff. Like, here it's like, okay, things are a little bit more under control. We've had a year of uh, devs and publishers kind of being able to wrap their head around what working from home looks like to what it like to some hybrid extent and i think that with that we're going to get some announcements maybe not things that are imminent but i do think that we're about to get a wave of next gen which is current gen now ps5 xbox series x announcements of of new gen of games that we're going to be playing in a couple years but i think we're going to get a wave of things to be to start getting excited for the future for what are your hype levels at do you think this is going to be a a banger ass game awards i you know, I, I think that it's going to be a banger game awards. I don't think it's going to be the game awards of all time. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think that it, it could have been. I think this year really could have been it had the pandemic stuff not happened because the 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 momentum that he's had the last couple of years with these shows was like so fantastic. And then, yeah, obviously having to do a digital show and all that stuff was not as hype. I think this year it's the first show back. I'm not necessarily expecting it to be like the – a perfect 10 out of 10. Um, but I, I do think we're going to get some really, really cool announcements, some really cool updates. And I have high expectations, but that's because uh, Jeff and the team have proven that we should expect a lot from these shows. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm excited about it. I'm also thinking a lot about what next year is going to be because next year is already a banger. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's a lot more to talk about at the Game Awards in terms of games that are coming out next year or might get dated for next year or that are announced that, that are coming next year because... We're at that point of the new generation of consoles now where we've we've gotten over that first year hump. And even with the first year, this first year of video games for new gen has been fantastic. I think of killer. I, I, I think of 2014 when it comes to the PS4 and Xbox One. And that was a pretty dull year, right? Like there are some pretty cool games like Shadow of Mordor was 2014. Like some other games were 2014. Dragon Age Inquisition was 2014. And you had, you had quite a few games that spoke to different people. But then 2015 came through and that's when we got... The Witcher 3 and Metal Gear Solid 5 and Bloodborne and Rocket League and like a bunch of games that really helped define what that generation was going to end up being. I could see next year 
being that like in terms of timing right that works out but then in terms of games that we already have announced you know i mean we talk about all the time but like elden ring horizon forbidden west saints row like starfield it's already looking to be a better year god of war ragnarok right and surely some of these things are going to get shifted and, and moved and a lot of that has to do with pandemic and video games being hard to make and all these things but we're hitting that point where now i'm like shoot yeah like we're 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 getting into the thick of it of the new generation of consoles so i'm super excited about the game awards and i'm super excited about next year yep Tim, speaking of next-gen, new-gen console, story number three, the Xbox Series S was Black Friday's best-selling console. I'm pulling from Zach Zweizen at Kotaku. It appears that over the Black Friday shopping period, it wasn't the Switch or PS5 that was selling like hotcakes, but instead the less powerful Xbox Series X sibling, the $300 Xbox Series S. As reported by Business Insider, the news comes uh, from the Adobe Digital Economy Index, which claims to have analyzed over 1 trillion visits to retail sites and also surveyed over 1,000 retailers on what items were selling better than others. All this data seemingly points to the big winner of the Black Friday shopping season being the tiny Xbox Series S. At first, this might seem surprising, but there are a few reasons this smaller Xbox is doing so well. For one thing, it's actually available at many stores. Right now, it's very hard to get your hands on a $500 PS5 or Xbox Series X. However, the Series S has been available to buy at various stores for days now, including GameStop and Best Buy. Another thing helping the Series S is Game Pass. Between Forza Horizon 5, Halo Infinite, and a large library of older games, older and newer games, uh, the service provides folks with a lot of stuff to play at a low cost. Interestingly enough, last year Xbox boss Phil Spencer co- told Kotaku that he expected this he, expe- he expected this saying, quote, "I think over the generation our expectation would be that price really matters and that you would see the the Xbox Series S sell more." End quote. Tim, what are your thoughts on this? Does price really matter? I mean, I think this is this is great, right? The, especially this weekend with Halo multiplayer already out, with Halo campaign coming in just a couple weeks next week. Holy crap. Um, man, uh, the video games have been so impressive the last couple of years. The numbers they're putting up are just out of this world, setting records every single time. I don't think it's a surprise the Series S is the highest selling this weekend for every reason they just explained there. Uh, it really does come down to stock. But I'd be interested if that wasn't the um case like if it was unlimited supply of all these things how would that shake out right um i do think that xbox having that option and having the series s and x both be more than good enough uh to be able to play all the games i think is uh really setting xbox up for a lot of success especially when you pair it with uh game pass i think that we're still at that point that the general public doesn't know the value of xbox right now and is still a little confused with the amount of SKUs out there and uh just with what the xbox offering is but you got to imagine in just a couple years uh what all it takes is somebody to to try game pass and understand what it is and to really be like oh yeah this kind of is netflix for gaming in a way that i didn't ever expect video games to be possible like once you get that and once more people get that then everyone's gonna be like well i need i need an xbox of some sort because that there's just such a value there and if you're a value hunting person 300 dollars for the ability to play all of these games is really, really, really enticing. So I think Xbox made a very, very smart, wise call to to have the dual SKU set up. And I think that it'll pay off for them a lot more than it is right now once they get out of the Xbox One side of things. Yeah, I, I I think you make the good point in terms of what is the wider mainstream perception of the Xbox Series S? Do people know that, you know, this thing exists as a legitimate entry to next gen? And I think for that, it probably only takes a little bit of research, right? Especially on a Black Friday where people are like, cool, I want to get into next-gen gaming or I just want a new gaming console. I want to, I want the new freshness. How many clicks, how much research does it take to like look into, oh shit, this is $300 and it's available. I can get it right now. Damn, that's a deal. And I can play whatever next-gen game I want. I can play the new Halo, even though you can play the new Halo on Xbox One. I can play the new Halo in a next-gen way on my Xbox Series S, right? I think there's, uh, there's big value there and combining the Xbox Series S with Game Pass and Xbox's whole platform right now of value and and giving people an easier way to jump in, I think it makes sense that the Xbox Series S is thriving, of course, with stock and all that stuff. But removed from that, I wouldn't be surprised if it was thriving anyway, if the numbers were rivaling an Xbox Series X. Well, so that's the thing that I'm interested in is I 
I'm willing to bet that it it wouldn't rival it, but I do think it would be very high. And I think that the it would go PS5 for sure at the number one, and then probably mm-hmm. Xbox uh, Series X, maybe the Switch OLED. But Switch is always that weird thing where there's just an inherent value to the Nintendo, uh, to the Switch at least, line of things, yeah. because there's so many people buying a second or a third or a family one or whatever um, in a way that they don't do with other consoles. But having said that, I think that Xbox is kind of setting it, itself up where more so than ever – they're kind of giving gamers the option to have multiple Xboxes in their house where they're like, cool, your big man cave mm-hmm. setup is going to have the Series X. But if you want another one for the bedroom when you just want to play a couple of games, the Series S isn't that much money if you have the means to do that. And I think that that puts them in a unique spot that PlayStation right now, PlayStation right now is just the premium, right? It's just the most yeah. expensive. It's like the, the disc or the discless. And like uh, both of those are still the premium option, right? Yeah. Um, but I, I'd be really interested to see the numbers if there weren't any of these limitations because I imagine that it'd go PS1 or sorry, PS5, then Xbox Series X, somewhere the Switch in there, going down to the S, but combining the S and the X, would that outpace the PS5? That's the thing I'm most interested in. And mm-hmm. I think that there is a conversation there. And I think that that's a conversation that Xbox is probably thrilled to be in. Yeah, I'd be shocked if both of them together were outpacing the PS5. But on the opposite hand, I think that combined with people playing Xbox games on PC and people that that just have Game Pass, uh, the user base there, I wouldn't be surprised if those numbers were high enough where Xbox is like, dude, we're thriving. Like, this is what we want. Like, when you when you take all of that into consideration with each other, the people that are playing Halo and Forza right now on Series X, Series S, and PC – those numbers are probably astronomical given the those games being included on Game Pass, but then just those those games being available on those different platforms. I'm sure that's huge. I would I would really like I would love a conversation about like how those numbers compare to like the PS5 console sales numbers and how like how each company views that. Cause I think there's I think there's a lot there to dig into. And I wouldn't be surprised if Xbox are looking at their numbers right now and going, fuck, we are exceeding all of what, what we predicted to be at right now. And so, mm-hmm. you know, Tim, speaking of value. Let me tell you guys about patreon.com slash kind of funny games where you can go to get the show ad free. And speaking of ads, let us tell you about our sponsors. This episode is brought to you by Liquid IV. Did you know that colder weather makes it easier to miss the classic signs of dehydration like overheating and perspiration? That's why, even though it's colder out, it's more important than ever to keep your body properly hydrated. Luckily, Liquid IV makes hydration easier than ever. I love Liquid IV. Uh, There's been a ton of mornings where I'm waking up not feeling that great. Then, boom, you pour some of this in the water. Next thing you know, you're hydrated. Uh, Liquid IV is not an actual IV drip but it does hydrate you faster and more efficiently than plain old water. But that's because Liquid IV uses cellular transport technology, which is a very fancy way of saying it contains the perfect balance of vitamins to help you hydrate quicker. Grab your favorite Liquid IV flavors nationwide at Walmart, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use code KFGD at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order when you get better hydration today using promo code KFGD. AFGD at liquidiv.com. Next up, shout out to Purple. There's no gift better than the gift of a great night's sleep. Give yourself the gift of the best of the best, a Purple mattress. I have so many glowing things to say about purple. You guys have heard it for years. The pillow changed my life because guess what? There is no hot side. You never need to flip it to the cold side because they're both cold sides. It's fantastic. Purple mattresses are the best because they're the only ones around with the gel flex grid. That's what makes all that flipping possible. It's a super stretchy, ultra squishy material that adapts and flexes around pressure points, supports and cushions you in all the right places and doesn't retain heat. Oh, and I love that. Getting a great night's sleep starts with having a great mattress. Get a purple mattress go to purple.com slash games 10 and use code games 10 for a limited time you can get 10 percent off any order of 200 dollars or more that's purple.com slash games 10 code games 10 for 10 percent off any order of 200 dollars or more purple.com slash games 10 promo code games 10 terms apply and finally shout out to DraftKings, nfl fans the fantasy football season doesn't just start in september every week is a new shot to win big cash prizes at DraftKings, the official daily fantasy partner of the nfl and this week new customers can play free for millions with their first deposit don't sit on the sidelines get in the game playing daily fantasy football is simple just pick your lineup of nfl stars while staying under the salary cap and score enough points to bring home cash and 
with a free shot at millions of dollars in total prizes, you'll feel the NFL action like never before. DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. Best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. Download the DraftKings app now and use promo code KINDAFUNNY to play free for millions. That's right. Enter promo code KINDAFUNNY to get a free shot at millions in total prizes with your first deposit. Do not miss out. Download DraftKings and play with the official daily fantasy partner of the NFL. There's a minimum $5 deposit required. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for details. Tim, you know what it is? I think where my mind got uh, things crossed with the Animatrix and the Men in Black animated series was that Will Smith was picked to be Neo originally, right? In 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 the Matrix, he was he he was supposed to be cast as Neo before he was like, no, I'm gonna do Wild Wild West instead. And then you know, Keanu Reeves, the homeboy, ended up getting it. I think that's what where an, I got like, the line. What an interesting crossed. decision that was. You know what I mean? Where he was like, I just. I just believe prob- in Wild Wild West more, you know? <laughs> you know what they did? They probably showed him that tarantula at the end. He was like, holy shit. This yeah. is next you, level. I bet you Cisco was like, yo, man, this, like, I, I, like, I'm involved in the music. This shit's going to be a banger. Well, that, yeah. Yeah, that's the was. problem. The Wachowskis, it, you know what I mean? the Wachowskis were like, we can't, you're not going to get a, a song at the end. And he was like, I'm out. Can't do it. Yeah. I need to rap. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I can't be contained. I got to get these bars Plus, off. <laughs> uh, it's funny you bring this up. Dude. I don't want to go off too much on a tangent here, but this mm. weekend I listened to Will Smith's Lost and Found album oh my for the God. first time in about 10 years. And oh, what a banger it is. It really is good. <laughs> which album Which which album was this? It's like 2006 album. The, was this the one with Switch it's on like, it? Come, yeah, it's the one with Switch. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. No, I, dude, right? what a banger of an album. Yeah. It's underrated, no, I man. I'm telling you. I, I, I love that album. Tim, speaking of Keanu Reeves and Cyberpunk World, story number four, Cyberpunk 2077 is getting a recent boost. This is Andy Robinson at Video Games Chronicle. A Cyberpunk 2077 designer has thanked fans following a flood of very positive user reviews on Steam this week. Cyberpunk is currently Steam's global top seller following a 50% price discount as part of Steam's autumn sale, which saw it reduced from $60 to $30. The influx of new players appear to have had a, a much better experience with the RPG than those who picked it up at launch, since the game's user rating has been upgraded to very positive thanks to more than 18,000 recent reviews. Previously, 2077 had a mostly positive user rating based on some 404,000 combined user reviews submitted to date. Responding to the news, CD Projekt's quest director for Cyberpunk, Powell Sasko, uh, thanked fans on Twitter. Quote, you can't imagine what it means to me, he wrote. Thank you so much, end quote. In June, CD Projekt said it believed Cyberpunk 2077's performance had reached a, quote, satisfying level following six months of patches designed to improve the game from its much-criticized launch, sta- launch state. Speaking in a new interview with a Polish uh, economic newspaper, Adam Kaczynski argued that the brand awareness generated by the game means it'll eventually be seen as a success, despite its rocky launch last December. Quote, we believe that in the long run, Cyberpunk 2077, we perceived as a very good game. And like our other titles, it'll sell for years, especially as the hardware gets more powerful over time and we improve the game, he said. Quote, we're working on updates all the time, and we're also working on a, on a version for the latest generation of consoles. Of course, the original release taught us a lot. It gave us a kick and motivated us to make changes that'll, that'll make us better in the future. End quote. Tim, does this one surprise you at all? Uh, I mean, no, not really. Like, I feel like this is an inevitability with this game where it's just like it's going to last long enough to kind of fix itself enough that people are like, hey, it's cheap enough. I want to give this thing a shot. I like RPGs and it works, you know, and if mm-hmm. you there's the, what people need to remember is the majority of people out there aren't reading these headlines. They don't know this whole story and they're just like, oh, there's this game. And if it has good reviews and they're playing, they're like, hey, this is great. If it is great, then that's all they need to know. They don't care about the launch. They don't care about the tumultuous year and a half or whatever it's been. Um, I do think that they're this again is talking about the Steam version. So it is the PC version, of which course. was already uh better than the the console versions of the game. And this game is just going to keep getting better. It's never going to reach the heights that it was expected to or could have. And I think that that's that's just the reality of it. But yeah, these numbers don't surprise me. Uh, PC players love RPGs and Steam players love sales. So you combine those things and guess what? It's going to be a good time. Yeah, I think you make the good point in terms of like not everybody pays attention to all the headlines, right? Like not everybody was super in tune to the cyberpunk fiasco this time last year in the way that all of us here and all of us probably listening to this podcast and other video game podcasts and content out there probably were. If I was just a random person that went on Steam, saw a cyberpunk game on sale for 30 bucks and went, 
oh shit, like this looks cool. I like RPGs. I like first person shooters. Looks this looks cool. I play it, and that game, after all of its updates, actually like you know works without uh, all the bugs. I could come out of that being like, oh, that was a fantastic time. I came out of that game being like, yeah, that was a really good time, despite all the um, despite all the bugs that were present at the time I was playing. Uh, and so I don't think it's that surprising that more people are coming away away from the game nowadays, being like, oh no, like this is dope as fuck. I think the the thing that you know the the thing that I question in the article is the quote from Adam Kaczynski, Kaczynski talking about how yeah after a while we think that this game will be seen as as a success. I don't necessarily challenge that in terms of oh that's impossible, but I do think that is a big uphill climb. I think the perception uh, of 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 the game within the last year and just like the overall fiasco of launch of that game coming out, it getting pulled from the PlayStation Store, it being filled with bugs, it running so badly on, at the time, the current-gen consoles. I think that goes a long way into, I think, cementing some permanent damage to that IP specifically that I don't know if people are going to come out ever being like, oh, yeah, Cyberpunk is, is great now. Like, we all love it at this point. I I wonder if that can happen. I, I at Right now, I don't necessarily think it could. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's tough because I feel like there's a lot of people that have already made their decision on this game. Yeah. And like, there's a, a fairly sizable group of people that are like, oh, the problem with the game isn't the bugs and isn't this, it's that the game itself isn't good. And I don't think that that stuff is ever going to get fixed. And those people, they're, like, they're, their minds are not going to get changed. But mm -hmm. I think that there are millions of other people out there that don't have the knowledge of all this stuff that this, I do think at the end of the day, Cyberpunk 2077 is going to have sold millions and millions of copies and i think that the majority of people are going to have a positive experience with the game that doesn't mean the most vocal and that doesn't mean that it is as positive as expected from the makers of witcher 3 but i do think that they're going to just keep at it until it becomes something that is good enough and it just sucks that cyberpunk has to be good enough when it should be the best around i will say mm -hmm. that recently i was wearing my cyberpunk uh, bomber jacket which i love very dearly it's one of my favorite jackets and some random person on the street looked at me and was like that is the coolest jacket for the worst game <laughs> and i was just like awesome. Some, someone on the street knows so <laughs> yeah that's really funny um but yeah like I, I i wonder if them releasing on next gen quote unquote new gen consoles is gonna be a turning point at all like i wonder if them getting the game finally out on ps5 and xbox series x uh invites a new audience of people and if that game runs the way it should run I wonder if that is like the first step toward okay, we can we can get this momentum going. And I wonder if I wonder if they're able to make that happen and then follow that up with DLC, whether it is like a big story expansion or just big expansions in general to that game, or even the multiplayer stuff that they had announced, which seems to be shelved for now. I wonder if they're able to come back around with that stuff or some kind of expansion or some kind of content to drop and actually get people interested in a way that I know we we talk about No Man's Sky all the time. And No Man's Sky to some extent I think is a unicorn, but I wonder if they're able to pull something similar off where you know, after support, like after supporting that game like crazy over the years, if we look back and go, oh shit, like people love Cyberpunk now. I think it's possible, but it's, it'll, it'll take a lot of work. It'll take yeah, a lot I, of work. I mean, it's I never going to be The Witcher 3. It, it, I mean, I don't know that it's not going to be The Witcher 3. Like the thing is, that it will never be The Witcher 3 in the sense The Witcher 3 is beloved from day one. Like, yeah. so yes, it will never be that. But will it hit the sales numbers? Will it have the Steam reviews? I don't know that it won't. Like, I do think that they mm -hmm. that there's a big chance that it eventually turns it around for that group of people, which is a very sizable group of people. Yeah, and th them being confident in it too, I think invokes some hope because and I remember uh, earlier in the year when they put out their like marketing strategy for what CD Projekt Red was going forward, they they had Witcher and Cyberpunk as their main pillars and everything working under that. And right now, the Witcher machine is going right. We got, of course, like. The Witcher brand already established from like the books, but also they got the Witcher Netflix show, they got Witcher Gwent game, they got other Witcher stuff, they got the Witcher main game. They're probably gonna work on another Witcher. We got Witcher coming out, Witcher three coming out on next gen. Like they have that as a well well oiled machine. The other half of that is Cyberpunk, and they want Cyberpunk to be that, and they want so badly for Cyberpunk to be that that I wonder if this is a case of throwing enough money at it is gonna get it there. Again, we'll have yeah. to wait and see. We will. You know what? What else we'll have to wait and see for? Half Life Three story number five. Half Life Three is reportedly not in development. As Valve focuses on the Steam Deck, uh, this is Chris Scolian at Video Games Chronicle. Half Life Three is not in active development, and Valve is instead focusing on Steam Deck friendly titles, according to a report. Tyler or 
Talver, Tilver, Tilver, Tiver, McVicker of Valve News Network states in a new video that according to his sources, there is no sequel to Half-Life 2, Episode 2 currently in development. Quote, the end of Half-Life Alex, for those who haven't played it heavily, hints towards the continuation of Gordon Freeman's story. The issue is that at the current time, there isn't a major development team working on anything outside of the few pieces of software that are specifically tailored for hardware right now. Valve is trying to get the Steam Deck out, and like many people have observed, the Steam Deck has been significantly more successful than originally anticipated, so Valve is throwing a lot at it, end quote. McVicker claims that Valve is instead working on a separate project called Citadel, which McVicker has been reported, reporting on for some time. Quote, Valve is working on a piece of software to best showcase what the Steam Deck is capable of doing. Citadel. This is a nostalgia fest. This is a Half-Life based FPS slash RTS hybrid that is cooperatively based. Think about Left hmm. Dead or think about Left 4 Dead and Alien Swarm and RTS and Half-Life all having a baby. End quote. Tim, how does that sound to you? Uh, weird. Yeah, right. I mean, look, at the end of the day, it's Valve, right? So it's like they're going to do something and they're going to do it right, whatever it is. Uh, but it is interesting that they're, they're not doing Half-Life 3. I guess that's like the less surprising part, uh, or at least not working on it right now. But the the Steam Deck, them kind of trying to make a game that to show off this, what the Steam Deck is capable of doing. That's something that I yeah. shouldn't Sorry, be I'm surprised. Laughing, I'm laughing at chat because like there, <laughs> there was a honk that happened. <laughs> Like 10 seconds. <laughs> 10 seconds ago, there was a honk. And like, I was like, maybe chat didn't hear it. And like, I, I don't know where it came from. I don't know if that was Kevin or you. It was me. This construction going on. <laughs> it outside. sounded so weird, too. It was like a normal honk. It, it, was like, sounded, it sounded like a cartoon. Like, yeah, it, it, it sounded cartoon. like some Looney Tunes shit. <laughs> the whole chat's just honk, honk, honk. Oh, I fucking love it. Oh, um, God. Sorry about that. So, no, it's all good. Uh, but like, I, I kind of didn't expect them to want to be creating software for the steam deck right i kind of expected mm. it to just be more like hey it's a computer it's a platform to, for all the things that you already have on steam i didn't really think of them like oh we're gonna make stuff to show off the the use case for it which i think yeah. is cool in the same way that with their their vr unit they they made alex to kind of like really be the showcase for that that system if you want to call it that mm -hmm. yeah and I'm, I'm i'm right there with you that i did not expect them to put to start on develop developing software that is focused on that and i think that is purely because they've seen such a response for it that maybe they they look at that and they're like okay this warrants us to actually put in more effort and for hardware that is seeing this type of um reception like this type of this this amount of people showing up for it we have to we have to actually tailor co content for this now we have to give people even more reason to show up for it uh so that we can keep that momentum going and so that uh surprises me but for the reasoning doesn't necessarily surprise me the thing that surprises me more is the description of this game that is again think about left for dead and alien swarm and rts and half-life all having a baby that sounds ridiculous and i cannot wait to see the reveal trailer for this like i hope i hope it actually comes to fruition just so i can like see what this is because that sounds bonkers and that sounds like it sounds like a thing that people aren't asking for but i wonder if it becomes one of those things where people go i wasn't asking for this but uh i'll play this because this looks yeah hot. yeah i mean it's just weird enough that it could work but it's also not that surprising it's like taking a that the the rts side of things like uh mario plus rabbits kingdom battle right yeah. but adding that adding some first person shooter elements to it i think it could work yeah and I think it, it it could work when you when you combine it with like the Half Life IP. Like yeah, I wonder. Totally. I, I'm I'm very curious about that. It sounds cool and strange and different. And yeah, I'm all about it. I do think it's it's sad though that like it seems like they're not working on a mainline Half Life thing. Because I know that's another thing that people are actually asking for. But it's Valve. I don't think we really expected it at this point. I think at this point a lot of us have given up hope that, that they're working on that. But Tim, mm -hmm. you know what I'm hopeful for. Is story number six. Amazon wants to make a Mass Effect TV series. Uh, this is Luke Plunkett at Kotaku. It was first announced all the way back in 2010 that beloved sci-fi series Mass Effect was being turned into a movie. The project was only officially canceled earlier this year when Bioware's Mac Walters revealed that Legendary Pictures had finally walked away from the project. Deadline is now reporting that Amazon is nearing a deal to turn Mass Effect into a TV show instead. Tucked away in a story that's otherwise about the debut of Amazon's new fantasy series, Wheel of Time, is this short bit from Amazon Studios head Jennifer Salk. Quote, One of the company's newest hopefuls in the arena is Mass Effect. Amazon Studios is nearing a deal to develop a series based on the best-selling sci-fi video game franchise from, Ele from Electronic Arts. 
you'll see us continuing to invest in a fantasy in fantasy genre of all kinds. We have a genre-focused team on the ground in studios who work tirelessly with our creative partners on those slates, and you can look forward to more, Salk said. I think this sounds cool. It does sound cool. I mean, it's interesting right now with uh, the streaming wars that are happening of everybody gobbling up IP and trying to get that next hit, right? I think Game of Thrones and Walking Dead kind of changed the game in terms of TV and what expectations are for serialized storytelling um, on a kind of triple a budget to use game terms uh for tv shows right and now mm -hmm. we see uh the influx of that with even the hbo max shows and with uh, disney plus uh marvels and star wars shows and i think that amazon is in a unique place right now where they kind of don't have their mega hit but they are kind of like having like little corners and pockets of hardcore fans for things like invincible or the boys mm -hmm. and wheel of time i i feel like obviously they want it to be their big game of thrones moment but it doesn't seem to be kind of doing that quite yet um and i don't know that it ever necessarily will uh but this makes sense i think that kind of mining video game ip for movies and shows makes sense obviously like comic books um found the success there and now there is legitimately 14 comic book shows coming out uh at, every, at any given moment for the next couple of years and i think that we're going to start seeing a lot more video game things as well and i i don't think that there's necessarily that same worry that we've had before of like oh it's just gonna be a video game movie that those fucking suck like i think that now there's an equal chance of them sucking or being cool depending on what they are and they might not be what you expect but mm -hmm. things like sonic the hedgehog detective pikachu right like they're fun. It's not necessarily Pokemon in real life, uh, the one for one adaptation, but sometimes that's fine because I just watched Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City this week, and that was as close to a straight adaptation as we're ever going to get. And let me tell y'all, go not watch good. that fucking movie. It is trash <laughs> and it is going to make you laugh so fucking hard. Oh There's music choices in it that are baffling, blessing, baffling. The amount of times they reference the game in a on the nose way, it's like, whoa, they just did that. They did, did they just reference the Jill sandwich? Yeah, they did. Yeah, they fucking did. And they don't let you not miss it. Like, you got to. Oh, did somebody punch a boulder at some point? Dude. Did anybody punch a boulder? No boulder punching. Okay. No boulder punching. But anyways, did it's a fucking a trash hand? fire movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm usually trepidatious when it comes to video game adaptations into TV and movies. Just because, like, I, I, I think it's a way more difficult thing to pull off than a novel adaptation or like a, a comic book adaptations like i think you the 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 source material for video games often does already include cutscenes and voice acting and performances that you associate with a lot of characters but i think in some instances there is more promise than others like i look at something i mean you you just mentioned the resident evil movie right and how much they're they, they botched it and how trash it is but like, I, mean, it, here's I want to be clear i don't think they botched it i think that they took a B minus tier storyline and yeah. turned into a, a movie. <laughs> like it is what it fair, is. Fair. But also I think that is the that is a struggle that happens a lot when it comes to video game adaptations. And like I think something like Song of the Hedgehog or Detective Pikachu works because the source material there is not really that like it's not really that serious or intense or filled with like a lot to pull from. Of course, like there's there's Sonic the Hedgehog cutscenes and like, you know, voices that you that you associate with there, but it's so non-serious and it's so kitty that I'm not going to get mad at a Sonic movie that, like, is fine, right? I'm not going to get mad if Detective Pikachu isn't the greatest thing of all time. Mass Effect is one that I think a lot of people have a lot of, um, it like, pe people have a lot of expectation for, right? Pe Mass Effect has fans and fans that are fans of it because of the world and the narrative. I think the thing that gives me hope with Mass Effect is that for that, it is a world that, uh, you can't adapt as opposed to like the specific one for one stories of Mass Effect one through three. You don't have to do that, right? I, that, and that's one of the things I liked while playing Mass Effect for the first time earlier earlier in the year through the Legendary Edition. From Mass Effect one, they establish a universe. Like you go into the the glossary, you go into the uh, I forget the exact the exact word for it, like the compendium thing that tells you what all the different races are and who the different characters are. And it's like, dude, they are establishing a universe here. And I think with that, if you're going to adapt something like that, you have a lot to play around with that isn't just the main characters, right? You don't have to make a story around Commander Shepard if you don't want to. You can just make a story that takes place in the Mass Effect universe that uses a lot of the same things established in the, the game, but, you know, takes your own approach and doesn't feel pigeon held by that. Um, and so, like, I, I, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of potential there. I'm excited for this. I hope, I hope this comes to fruition and I hope it hits because I think 
there's something that you can do. Yeah, the, you can do something really cool with this. Yeah, I mean, sci-fi needs budget. That's the one thing, and I, I, yeah. I it needs budget. But for a story like Mass Effect, it also needs time. So I think making it a series is the right call. But is Amazon going to invest enough to make it work? We'll have to see. It, they, they've proven production studios have proven that they can make streaming sci-fi content work with things like Star Trek Discovery. Where like you look at that, you're like, how the fuck is this a TV show? Like they really did the damn thing. And yeah. Mass Effect needs to hit that level, and I don't know that it will uh, with Amazon. Like that is Amazon Studios is probably one of the least exciting of the groups for me to to, to have this happen. But at yeah. the same time, they once in a while have things like The Boys, which gra- granted much smaller scale than something you'd expect for a Mass Effect for that. But even that is yeah. pretty CG heavy, and it's not distracting. Yeah. Uh, shout out to chat. Codex was the word I was looking for. I uh, appreciate that. And then somebody else in chat mentioned Arcane, which I think is a really good example of, oh yeah, like take inspiration from the universe, take the universe and tell, tell a story in there that doesn't have to be one for one with a specific story that's told through the game. Uh, and yeah, like I think I think we're getting more examples of that. And so, yeah, I'm looking forward to what this is going to be. But Tim, the Mass Effect TV show is just so far away. Mm-hmm. If I want to know what's coming out to Mom Grab Shops today. Where did I look? The official list of upcoming software across each and every platform as listed by the Kind of Funny Games Daily Show host each and every week there. Yeah! Yeah! Out today, we got Guardian of Lore for Switch. Uh, new days for you. Atlas has announced that 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim is headed to Nintendo Switch, uh, launching April 12th, 2022. And then Crown Tricks Collector's Edition is launching December 10th. Remember, you can go to patreon.com slash kind of funny games. You can, you can skip the ads. You can write in with your questions, but you can also write in with your squad ups, just like Zombie High X23 did. They wrote in and said, a little different for a squad up, but tonight is the second night of Hanukkah. Can the Jewish best friends get a happy Hanukkah from the kind of funny games daily squad? We would appreciate it. Thanks. And of course, Zombie High, have a very happy Hanukkah. Hell yeah. That's awesome. Uh, remember, you can go to kindoffunny.com slash you're wrong. You write in let us know what we got wrong, as we got it wrong, so we can correct it for those watching later on youtube.com slash games and on podcast services around the globe. Uh, Nana writes in and says, Animatrix is on HBO Max, which I think we mentioned, but... Yeah, we said that. There you go. There you go. Animatrix is nine shorts. Thanks for nothing, Nano. Uh, Nano <laughs> says... Says the Wolf Among Us 2. This isn't you're wrong, but I I guess it's a good one to point out. The Wolf Among Us 2 was also revealed two and a half years ago, and we've seen nothing since. So there you go. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Hell yeah, man. Yeah. Look at us, bless. Killing the game. Killing the game. Uh, If you want to know who's hosting this week, uh, the days go like this. Tomorrow, you're getting Tim and gary on wednesday you're getting me and tim and no thursday, it's not me it's not gonna be me wednesday i don't know who it's gonna be but it's not gonna be me it's gonna be me and you gotta, question marks. You gotta get it you gotta get a host plus okay cool and i'm also looking at the calendar because i don't think i filled this out i don't think i've updated this since like last tuesday because we've had the week off uh okay here we go here we go so tuesday tim and gary wednesday me and question marks thursday it's tim and tam then on friday you're getting a special episode with janet and rebecca valentine so look oh, forward yeah. to that if you're watching this live on Twitch, after this is Mike and Nick with a kind of funny morning show. So get hyped for that. If you want to catch that stream later, you can subscribe to youtube.com slash kind of funny plays. Remember, this has been kind of funny games daily. Each and every weekday live right here on twitch.tv slash kind of funny games. We run you through the nerdy news you need to know about. We have a Patreon post show for those that are subbed at the silver level of patreon.com slash kind of funny games. So stick around for that. Otherwise, until next time, game daily.